Hello, I'm going to talk about folk tales. Um, I'm approaching this as a folklorist, and folklore as a discipline has been the premier discipline that looks at folk tales since the Brothers Grimm uh, about 200 years ago. Um, I'm going to give you, I'm going to talk a little bit about form, and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the history of, of how and why we study this. Um, folk tales, folklorists use that as a term to discuss stories that originally were in oral tradition and then got written down at some point by somebody. Uh, and the thing is, because we privilege uh, the written word, that then becomes the official version that we compare other versions to. And yet folklorists know that a lot of people orally tell folk tales, even today, as much as we think that's weird, um, they do. Um, and folklorists today are much more concerned with who is telling it, what was the context in which they told it, because we craft our stories to meet our audience all the time. And so you make things longer for certain audiences, shorter for others, you emphasize this for some audiences, you emphasize that for other audiences. Uh, and they're also performative. Um, and so when we record them today, we will write them down and try to indicate some, something about that performance in some way to sort of help you understand how and why this person uh, told this story. Um, we use the term fairy tale for literary productions. They were always literary. They might have been inspired by folk tales, but it was Hans Christian Andersen sitting down, writing a story. He is the author. He made it up out of his head. Um, maybe inspired by folk tales, but it's a literary creation. And there are some that kind of fit in the middle because there, are, there were some folks in France, uh, Madame Donnois and uh, Charles Perrault, who were writing literary creations based on folk traditions, based on what Charles Perrault said um, were the tales of my mother the goose or mother goose. Um, but they were crafted in a literary style and they were written down. Angela Carter does this now. Um, all kinds of people are writing literary versions of folk tales now for fun as short stories. Um, so they kind of overlap and literary folk tales will get back into the oral tradition because some mom or dad read some Hans Christian Andersen story or Charles Perrault's version of Cinderella and then tells it orally to their kid. Um, so they move back and forth between genres. But when we say folktale, usually we mean a story that started in oral tradition and then got written down. And when we say literary fairy tale, we mean something that has a single author and <clears throat> was written down in a specific time period um, and then might go into the oral tradition, maybe. Who knows? So the reason why we know that folktales um, originated in oral tradition, sometimes the Brothers Grimm say, I got this from the oral telling of somebody. Um, other times you can look at the formal... Um, characteristics of a folktale to see that it's a folktale. And one of those formal characteristics is repetition. Orally, we love repetition. That's why there's choruses to songs. We love things that repeat. We find it aesthetically pleasing. And so that's why in a lot of folktales, you will find things happening three times. There were three sons, and the first son tries it, and then the second son tries it, and the third son succeeds. Or in the original um, Cinderella written down by the Brothers Grimm, she goes to the ball three times. Um, Indo-Europeans love threes, so we do everything in threes. Chinese people love fives, Native Americans love fours, but Indo-Europeans love threes. Um, so there's this repetition. And when you read repetition, you think, oh my gosh, this is the most boring thing I've ever read. I can't believe I have to read this again. I just read it like a page, half a page ago. But orally, we seem to love it. And this is one of the hallmarks of something that came out of oral tradition, is that it's got that kind of repetition in it. Um, we also uh, will notice formulaic phrases that repeat. Uh, Albert Lord and Milman Parry uh, were two scholars who looked at oral epic poetry, uh, Homer, first of all, and look at the repeating formulaic phrases in Homer, like the, the strong grieved Achaeans and rosy fingered dawn, the wine dark sea, all of those sorts of things. And that seemed to him that this was part of an oral tradition. And then they looked at Serbian, to them contemporary, uh, epic poetry reciters, and they began to realize that they were doing the same thing with these formulaic phrases. And so they started to look at how it's the oral composition theory, where these things aren't exactly memorized. It's more like how we tell jokes. You have to know the punchline, you have to know certain things, but to get from point A to point B in the joke, you can fill in on your own, 
so long as you have that nugget that has to be there. And it's the same thing, apparently, they say, with Homeric poetry and with these Serbian uh, epics, because sometimes the, the poet, the Serbian poet would say, I'm saying the same thing, but they would record them. And sometimes it was longer and sometimes it was shorter based on the audience. And what they were doing was using these formulaic phrases which fit the meter of the poetry and around which the story hangs. And then how you get in between them is kind of up to you. Uh, I noticed the same thing in ballads because I'm a traditional ballad singer. There's the Berry Brown Steed that shows up in half a dozen ballads. There's the um, certain phrases that just fit and they, they migrate and they just sort of show up. So sometimes you find things like that in folktales as well. Um, so you get this oral to literary uh, life cycle of folktales, but you also get what we call tale types. And this is a type of a story where we recognize it. We know a Cinderella story when we hear it. We go, oh, that's a Cinderella story. That means we're recognizing a tale type. And folklorists have been documenting types of the folktale for a really long time. There's a whole system of numbering them. It's called the Arna Thompson Tale Type Index. And they assigned, um, Stith Thompson and Anta Arni assigned numbers to each of these tale types. And we recognize a type because it has a certain number of motifs in common. And by motifs, I don't mean like grand themes like death or love. I mean a story nugget that stands out, like Wicked Stepmother, or Disguised Prince, or Enchanted Husband, or, um, you know, uh, Kind Sister, Unkind Sister. Things like that, that, these nuggets that stand out and you recognize them, and then you recognize them when you see them in another story. So if a story has enough of these nuggets in it, we go, oh, this is the same type of story. Cinderella exists in two subtypes. So you have 410, I know the number because I'm cool, uh, you have 410A, which is uh, the, the version most people know is the French donkey skin. There was a king and his wife dies and as she's dying she says, promise me you won't marry anybody unless she's at least as pretty as me. And he says, okay. His daughter grows up and he goes, wow, you're as pretty as your mom. I think I'll marry you. And his advisors think this is a bad idea. He doesn't care. And the daughter, to buy some time, she says, give me, give me a cloak made of donkey skins. Or sometimes it's a cloak of all kinds of fur. Or sometimes it's a cloak of, it's some weird thing. And he has to make it. And she takes it and she gets a couple other things like beautiful dresses in nutshells and she leaves. And she goes works as a scullery maid, and of course the prince is having a ball, and of course she breaks open these nuts and has these dresses three times, of course, and uh, she slips these little um, like charms, like a like a charm bracelet kind of charm, like a thimble, other things, into the prince's soup, and he's like, "Whoa, who is this?" So there's no slipper, but he recognizes her by the charm thing. He comes to the kitchen. He she didn't have time to dress out, so she's just thrown the cloak over, and he says, "Oh, you've got that cloth of gold dress underneath." There's recognition, and they get married. It's recognizably Cinderella because it's um, low-level woman working, uh, like cleaning things, recognized by prince, you know, disguised as up-level, and then becomes up-level. Uh, 410B is the one we're more familiar with. The Grimm's version has the girl going to the ball three times. There's no fairy godmother. Uh, it's the, the tree that grew on her mother's grave, watered by her tears, and the tree throws down a dress for each day, and it has the gory bits like, you know, the stepmother says, cut off your heel or cut off your toe to her own daughter so you can fit in that shoe, and then they get found out because it's bloody. Um, and then Charles Perrault did a literary version where he put in a, a fairy godmother and he put in uh, the glass slipper and all that kind of stuff. But they're recognizably Cinderella. So folktales exist in these types, and you can compare them across cultures, and you can compare them even to stories in the same culture, like, oh, this story is remarkably similar to this one. And if you're unlucky enough to have a folklorist for a mom, you'll be like my daughter, where every time I read her a, a story of any kind, I said, what story does this remind you of? Oh, we're reading Streganona's Big Anthony and, and the pasta pot that boils over. Doesn't that remind you of that story we read last week that had the oatmeal overflowing? It was a Scottish story. So I've been training her to recognize motifs that migrate from story to story and tale types from the time she was little. But she was also kind of doing it on her own. Well, this story with the, the bad girl who's rude to everybody and she gets toads coming out of her mouth is very similar to the bad girl who is rude to everybody and gets pitch poured all over her in this other story. Um, so when you look at stories across 
cultures, you can find these tail types because they seem to be rather universal. The Grimm's thought they were producing a work that showed the uniqueness of German culture. And what they really did was create a bunch of tales that let everybody else go, oh, we have stories just like that at home. Um, so that's something I talk to students to see if they can recognize tail types. Can you recognize another story that's like this one? I use the website Sir La Lune, which is a great um, website for fairy tales, and if you click on one of her annotated tales over to the side, it has something you can click on that says similar tales. And if you click on that, it's all tales of the same tale type that have certain differences, but they're recognizably the same story. Sometimes they'll have a motif the same, like the animal bridegroom. You get that in Beauty and the Beast. You get that in Cupid and Psyche, in a way. You get that in, um, uh, what's the other one? Uh, East of the Sun, West of the Moon, where a woman marries a guy and he's you know, some enchanted person and he's a bear by day or something. But sometimes it's not the same tail type because the frog princess is also an animal bride or bridegroom, but it's not the same story. So sometimes you can be led astray by one motif is the same, but the rest of them are not. So it's just, they have motifs in common, but they're not common enough to be the same tail type. Um, the last thing I want to say about this is if you're talking about hero stories, legends have migrating episodes also, that they'll have episodes in common even though everything else is different. And this is because we think heroes should behave in a certain way. And so these stories, kind of like a snowball, accrete other episodes that glom onto them because we think, well, Arthur should have done that, or Alexander should have done that, or George Washington should have done that. And so even though it's, a, it's like a nugget of a story that really belongs over someplace else, we jam it onto this hero, and this hero just sort of collects episodes. So you find Alexander the Great, who we know historically never fought a dragon, suddenly he's fighting dragons and rescuing princesses, because that's what heroes do. Or he's doing something that, like Theseus did, because that's what heroes do. And I know this story, and it sure would fit really nicely over here. So it helps to be aware of how we create these stories as listeners and as tellers. We are interactive with them. We, uh, when we retell them, we will modify them to suit our own aesthetic and because we think we need to stick something else. And sometimes we just forget and we stick an episode from that story in there. But these stories are dynamic in that way, which is why they're so interesting. And it's fun to compare tales across cultures and see what are the common elements and see what tale types are found in every culture. There's great books. There's uh, Cinderella, a, a case book, which talks about Cinderella stories in everything from ancient Egypt and China to all the different versions around Europe and in North America. And it's, uh, it's pretty fun to look at that kind of stuff. And that's my spiel about folktales.